Okay, after the coronavirus stopped our in-class meetings, I've been trying to figure out really the best way to um, meet your needs as the semester ends. Um, it would be boring beyond belief for me to walk you laborious through each of the chapters of the books that remain in our graduate contemporary sociological theory class. So instead of doing that, what I thought I would do is uh, present what I would call a skeleton key uh, to each of the texts that remain. So I'm using here a, a term that, that the mythologist uh, Joseph Campbell used when writing about um, you know, James Joyce's incredibly complicated uh, no, uh, sort of novel, uh, Finnegan's Wake. The book is so complex that, um, that it was difficult for readers to get, a, to get a hold of it. And so what Campbell did was sort of cut away and create a key that sort of cut away all of the inessential features and provided a way to unlock the book, the core meaning for the book, of the book, that provided readers with a way to sort of get inside of the book and begin to read it themselves and to, again, sort of unlock the central uh, features and, and, and arguments and, and, and to make the book relevant and, and comprehensible. So that's my goal. Now, now, obviously, the books that we're reading aren't as compli complicated as Finnegan's Wake, but they're still somewhat old and um, and odd. <laughs> um, I've been surprised as I've been rereading, uh, like, Debord's A Side of the Spectacle, uh, Baudrillard's uh, uh, Simulations. I've been sort of surprised at how much I don't like them. Uh, nevertheless, they're important and... and um, really relevant for understanding the moment that we're in. I mean, we're in the middle of a of, a, of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, it's it's April 2020. And um, the idea that we're living in a world where image has replaced reality, where politics has become a politics of distraction, a politics of, of, of uniting outside of the realm of work. Um, and, uh, you know, some of these themes that Debord and Baudrillard and others uh, wrote about are really, really important for understanding what's going on uh, right now. So, so anyway, my goal today then is to provide you with a skeleton key to Debord's The Side of the Spectacle uh, so that we can, uh, again, you can sort of get inside the book and, and comprehend it and understand it and, and read it on your own. Okay, so... Um, all right, so here we go. I apologize for my handwriting. It's just going to have to work. I'm tired of PowerPoint. And so um, we're going to try to disrupt PowerPoint and see if you can still read a cursive. I have a hard time reading my own, but maybe we can use uh, a sheet of paper and kind of reduce some of the complexity here. Okay, so um, so Debord wrote his book in, in um, 1967. It's an odd book. It actually reads almost like um, I don't know, like like something biblical or something. It says it's, it's like it's written really as a series of paragraphs. It doesn't have the kind of normal structure of a um, um, you know of a of a scholarly uh, book. It um, it doesn't have sort of like normal citations, the writing style. It, again, it's kind of aphoristic. It reads. Uh, closer to something like uh, you know, like one of Nietzsche's books, or or even something biblical, as opposed to um, you know your standard work published in the American Journal of Sociology. So it's an odd book. Probably wouldn't have been important except for the uh, the revolutions of of eighteen of nineteen sixty eight, and you know Debord's uh, 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 book played a similar sort of keying or framing role uh, to the uh, uh, sort of global uh, demonstrations and, and, and the revolutionary moment of, of 1968 as Marx and Engels' book, The Communist Manifesto, played to the revolutions of 1848. So The Communist Manifesto came out in 1847, and it was sort of retroactively seen as a kind of diagnostic indicator of the reasons why the revolutions of 1848 occurred and spread. And I think that Debord had a, a kind of similar impact, that the revolutions of 1968 were retro, people were casting around for a kind of theoretical or, or, or academic explanation for them, and Debord seemed to, to strike a chord. So as we're working our way through the book, um, and as I'm giving you the skeleton key to it, I'm going to emphasize a couple of things. First of all, Debord's book is very clearly a Marxist text. 
okay? It would be completely senseless uh, to attempt to make sense of the book without first having uh, sort of comprehended Marx, right? So, um, to me, what he really is trying to get at is, is, uh, is captured on paragraph 34, where he writes that the spectacle is capital accumulated to the point where it becomes image. And if you really think this through, that spectacle is capital accumulated to the point where it becomes image, that the rest of the book sort of begins uh, uh, to make sense, okay? So what is capital? Remember that from our reading of Marx, capital is, we'll head to the very end, right? Um, if I can find the end. Ah. Here it is, right there. Okay, yeah. So, uh, you know, capital to Marx is essentially a kind of, uh, it's dead labor embedded in something like machines or workstations that absorb human energy or in human attention, what's generally known as human labor, right? And then therefore generates what, what we know as surplus value. Value is human life, uh, dead, lab, uh, dead, lab, dead life basically, and that capital is a mechanism for extracting labor from human beings, surplus labor, surplus value and embedding it in commodities, and then the value is realized as the commodities are exchanged, and, and, and so on. So capital is this machine, this mechanism for absorbing human energy, human attention, human labor, and thereby generating surplus value as a result. So if spectacle is capital accumulated to the point where it becomes image, then spectacle is itself uh, part of capital. It is, it is a form of late capital, Right, something that is sort of again, it kind of emerges in 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 the post World War II period, that enables capital and capitalists to absorb human energy, attention, and labor by ensuring that the um, you know that the that the um, uh, that the aggregation of human beings in production facilities in offices in factories and plants, that the aggregation of human beings, the generation of these new social forms of work, um, ensuring that the surplus that's generated by that aggregation doesn't become revolutionary activity or even something like a strong workers movement or a strong labor movement. Instead, spectacle ensures that the surplus energy generated by the aggregation of human beings and production facilities dies into um, this in, 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 into spectatorship, right? Um, dies into politically impotent um, viewing. Of, of television, of movies, of Netflix now, of, of, um, of, of websites, of social media, politically impotent, right, uh, viewing of, of, of spectacle rather than politically potent action, okay? So what capital must forestall or must prevent is the generation of class consciousness and the generation of revolutionary activity. As long as that is forestalled, then capital is sort of playing out on its own dynamics. The transition out of capital into after capital occurs when class consciousness and revolutionary activity form a kind of uh, critical mass that then moves, us, uh, moves history forward, that generates the big event that moves history forward. So, Something happens in the 20th century whereby class consciousness seems to be, um, um, for again, forestalled. It doesn't develop. Revolutionary activity and action doesn't happen. And instead, workers become um, consumers and they become spectators. That the t Where the time off of work, right? Um, so this is paragraph 27 where the board writes that that workers in capital are doubly alienated. They're alienated at work during time on, and then they're also alienated in time off in leisure consumption and speculation. So the kind of real alienation of the worker in the workplace, in the factory, in the office, in the field, is doubled in this new form of psychological social alienation um, 
separation, atomization, individualization, the prevention of, of sort of powerful, potent aggregates capable of challenging capital's power, right? Uh, that this is forestalled or prevented um, by spectacle, okay? So workers are alienated at work, time on, and then they're doubly alienated in time off and leisure uh, consumption and, and, and spectatorship, okay? So this is board. Something happened where, where the consciousness of the proletariat and capital didn't crystallize into potent uh, political activity, and instead it was sort of drained away or captured or uh, hijacked by something called spectacle. And spectacle is, we're going to find out, is something that is actually part of capital. Okay, it is capital accumulated to form where it becomes an image and then the image becomes something that captures the consciousness of workers and prevents the formation of powerful revolutionary uh, action or even social movements capable of pressing for for something like labor's um, uh, needs and desires. Okay. So to me, that is the central, that's the skeleton key to the book. The book is really not about the media and film and so on as such. It's actually about the way that uh, that that mediated forms of capital, that information technology, broadcast technology, um, the film industry, the radio industry, the television industry, right? Uh, social media, the internets, so on. How these technologies, these products of capital don't uh, are not merely commodities that are sold and purchased by consumers but that they also become key to capital's continued accumulation by preventing workers from forming from uniting and forming powerful revolutionary groups and activities and instead keeping them sort of locked into these um, again pacified um, uh, deanimated uh, impotent uh, um, social groupings uh, of spectatorship, which is what the society of spectacle actually is, right? So, so De Board's title, the Society of Spectacle, is pointing to um, it, it, again to to these aggregations of people as spectators. So, spectators we're going to find becomes a cru crucial social role, and living in a world where we are primarily social through our consumption and then sort of secondary uh, uh, discussion and reflection of, of spectacle uh, to those in our social world. As I'm listening to myself, I don't know if that makes any sense at all. And if it doesn't, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to roll forward here, I guess. So, okay. So, um, all right. So chapter one is called Separation Perfected. And what he's referring there to is the separation of, of, of workers. So, again, in Marx's um, theory of capital, workers are aggregated, condensed, and confined within uh, these new modern workplaces, right? Industrial factories, industrial offices, you know, uh, and so on. So, so you get a kind of, again, a kind of condensed aggregation of incredibly large numbers of workers next to each other. People who have sort of lost all of their other social ties and remain, again, primarily people who live uh, through work. So they're united, workers are united in capital in the work process. So they're united. As such, they're dangerous. And so spectacle is the mechanism for separating workers from each other and reuniting them in a politically impotent, safe for capital uh, arrangement called the Society of the Spectacle. Okay? All right. So just to step back a little bit, so the theme for this unit of the course, and for really all of my courses on sociological theory, emphasize that sociology is a science, right, that studies or comprehends the history and structure of social misrecognitions, right? So the basic idea is that human beings have always had a hard time um, correctly identifying uh, the social world and the impact and the, uh, of the social world upon them. They really have a hard time identifying the, the true source of social forces, right? In Marx's term, societies generate a surplus. 
and uh, uh, and this this surplus of dead labor tends to ride herd over or rule the living and the living have a hard time understanding that they themselves are the ones who made um, the thing that rules over them right so the alienated products of human labor becomes things like totems or gods or capital that then rules over human beings that human beings have always misrecognized the things that they create as totems as demons as idols as icons as gods and so on and so this is what sociology does sociology studies this history of the social misrecognition of the human forces of the social forces that we ourselves generate right it's the study of the history and structure of the ways that we get it wrong okay so the core method the er method of social theory especially critical social theory is something called defetishization so defetishization is the process whereby you take something that a society has identified as potent and radiating power and you invert it and see it instead of something that has its own independent power as something that is created by society and merely reflects social power uh, back at its creators, right? So a fetish object is a thing created by human beings that seems to radiate power and to defetishize that object is to see that it instead of being something that radiates power, it instead is something that merely reflects back power onto its creators, but in a distorted way that makes it difficult for the creators to see that they themselves have created the thing that has power, okay? So defetishization is the project of critical social theory. We're trying to look at things that we've done, that we've created as a society, and trying to reveal back to us how it was, um, again, a thing that was created by this. So the book opens with uh, with a quote from Feuerbach's um, Essence of Christianity, which is sort of one of the great books that that does this great inversion that says that that gods appear to be the things that create human beings, but when looked at sort of correctly, uh, uh, at least sociologically, we can see that in fact people or societies are the things that create gods right that's the essence of of christianity to him is that is that the, you know the christian faith is something that was created by um uh, by christians essentially right so um that's wrong in detail but you get the point right okay so so what sociology does is trains us to see through the surface appearance of social context to the structure that uh, as uh, we're trying to see through the appearance of social content to the structure that determines misperception okay so we're not interested in the image of things that are created by society but instead the symbolic order or the structure that determines the way that we misperceive the thing that we create in other words we're not interested in the, the surface content but the deep structure okay all right so de board gives us um, in paragraph four, the kind of sociological framing of the book, the way that this book is about the defetishization of something he's calling the spectacle. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at, at paragraph four. Okay, so in paragraph four, Debord writes, the spectacle is not a collection of images, rather it is a social relationship between people that is mediated by images, okay? So I've got my little drawings here in the margin. I tried to do them a little bit better here. Um, so let's take a real quick look here at my sort of cobweb drawings. Um, so, you know, the, this is an image of, of Emile Durkheim's um, sort of a traditional village um, in Durkheimian uh, uh, social theory, a traditional village um, generates something like a ritual order, and then uh, and and and, the, and and worships. The rites seem to worship, to feed, to defend something like a a totem, uh, something like a local god, a fetish object, something like that. Right. So a, a group of people come together and form uh, ritual uh, aggregations. The power of the group itself is projected onto a fetish, a totem, or a god. 
But the power of the group is always the thing that determines whether the god actually exists or has any power. So it's always a dialectical activity. It's a two-way activity. Uh, there's always a collective element where it's the, the sort of the milling and the aggregation and the kind of shared energy, what Durkheim calls the collective um, effervescence um, of the uh, group of people, the fever of the group of people that come that, that sort of gets turned up as they come together into a small group, right, or into a, a ritual formation that generates the power that then appears to be God that's reflected back on the people, right? So the idea is that the fetish, the totem, the God, appears to be all-powerful, appears to be the, the object of devotion of each believer, but in Durkheimian social thought, of course, it's actually the believers themselves and their activity with each other that gets projected onto the fetish object or the totem of the God, which then radiates that, that, that power back onto uh, the creators. Okay, so it's always dialectical. All right. Now let's take a look at, at Marx. So this is sort of a really quick drawing of, of Marx's um, uh, structure. So this is the structure, I'm sorry, of traditional society, mechanical solidarity and traditional societies. And this is sort of a drawing of, of, um, of alienated labor in Marx. We've got something like an assembly line here. We've got a bunch of workers on the assembly line. Uh, they're atomized, they're alienated, right? They're not relating to each other in any of those four ways that, that, that Marx writes about, right? They're alienated from each other. They're alienated from the, the process of work. They're really alienated from their own species being, and um, right? And so the product, the process from the other workers and from their species being, they're alienated in all four ways. Okay, so in other words, as workers, they're aggregated together and unified, but somehow or other, because of the structure of capital and the management of capital, um, workers wind up separated and alienated from each other. This is what management does. And that, you know, what the uh, proletariat revolution, class solidarity, the labor movement, and so on, the communist movement, uh, meant to bring workers together. So get them, they're, they're aggregated in the plant, they share interests and, and experience as workers and then to provide them with a kind of political context where there's uh, uh, something like deliberation, uh, congregation, uh, voting, and so on, where the workers form something like a potent political group where a consciousness forms of themselves as workers, uh, having leaders and so on, where they can become politically potent and challenge the power of capital, getting wages and, and so on, and hopefully, ultimately, replacing capital with a more human um, um, uh, a focused uh, structure. But uh, what I try to draw here is that the workers in the uh, proletarian movement are going to be related to each other and talking to each other back and forth. It's going to be a multi-sided, multi-way uh, deliberation. It's not one way. It's not two way. It's multi-way. Okay. All right. So the structure of the proletariat revolution is going to look like that. The structure of alienated work and capital is going to look like that. People are aggregated, but nevertheless psychologically, socially separated. Here's the structure of traditional society. All right. Well, here's uh, from paragraph four, the de-fetishized structure of the society of spectacle. Separation perfected. So the idea is, is that the workers get off work, and instead of going to a workers' meeting or a communist party meeting or a workers' party meeting or a labor party me meeting or a union meeting or something like that where they're talking about their experience at work, their identity as workers, and so on, and becoming a politically potent force of change, workers are instead diverted. They go home or they go to the film, uh, a, a cinema, or they go to a bar where there are, are uh, screens uh, with something like sports on, 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 on the screens or maybe Fox News on the screen. Or they go home and they turn on the television or they go home and they check social media or they go home and, in other words, something happens after work where they're not winding up in these politically potent groupings. Instead, they're joining a different society, a different sort of social alignment or social arrangement and aggregation of human beings called the society of spectacle, in which they're engaged in one-way, unbalanced uh, uh, power relations. Okay, so I've got here a bunch of seats. These could be seats in a, 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 a theater, seats in, a, um, in your house if you have a very big family. Um, but you're pacified. You're sitting 
as a spectator. Okay, so what does a spectator do? Well, they spec refers to eyes, right? Vision. So they're viewing things. So you're passively viewing something called a spectacle. And when spectators relate to each other, they're only relating to, they're primarily relating to the spectacle. And then when we relate to each other, they're relating to each other only through their shared identity as spectators, right? So two people who are both fans of, say, the Kansas City Chiefs come together and they talk to each other primarily about the Chiefs, right? Or the Iowa State uh, uh, Cyclones, they come together and, and, and talk about that. Or, or um, NASCAR, they talk about uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and his number eight car. I'm, I'm getting it wrong these days. But at any rate, you know, they come together and they're, they're, they're fans, essentially, or shared spectators of a given event or a given structure. And they relate to each other primarily in terms of of their shared identity. So I'm only going to talk about baseball. I'm only going to talk about basketball. I'm only going to talk about um, my political party. I'm only going to talk about uh, the Netflix series that I'm watching right now that I'm tweeting about or that I'm posting about on social media. Um, I'm only going to talk to people about the coronavirus because right now that's the spectacle that we're all uh, sort of watching, right? And so instead of relating to other human beings in terms of a a core existence in it in, a, in an actually lived environment we have people instead who are relating to each other only through shared spectatorships shared visual uh, and oral attention to something called a spectacle all right so the spectacle has all the power right you don't speak back to the spectacle it speaks at you right and so uh one of the later chapters or later in the chapter, DeBoard writes about television. We all think we're watching television. His claim is that television is actually watching us. And we know now with metadata and the way that metadata is being collected from smart TVs and from our cell phones and so on, we know that that's actually true. That, uh, that as you're watching almost anything these days, you're being watched at the same time. And the data about the amount of your spectatorship, the stream of spectatorship that you have, the relationship between your spectatorship and consumption and so on is all being, uh, you know, sort of abstracted from you as metadata. So, so what we have here then is a world of, where of an imbalance of power where the spectators are absorbing something called a spectacle their attention is being absorbed their activity they're being deanimated butts in seat right watching something right and so they're not engaged in this politically potent activity leading to a labor movement or communist movement or, or something like that progressive change of some kind instead they're watching and viewing and passively absorbing a spectacle and then relating to each other only as spectators. So this is what's crucial to DeBoard. Workers don't come together with other workers to talk about work. They're not coming together with other workers to talk about their common enemy, the capitalist owner. They're not coming together to talk about how they can resist some change that management is, is making that's going to be to their detriment. Instead, workers come together with other workers, and instead of talking about work, they're talking about their shared um, uh, relation to each other as spectators. This is what the society of the spectacle is. So instead of having a society of workers who have class consciousness, right, that gets negated, and you instead have a society of people who are united in alienated uh, absorption. Okay, that is the skeleton's key to the society of the spectacle. The recognition that the entire book is really about capital's generation of something like digital and, 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 and broadcast and other um, uh, spectacular uh, uh, images and, and image um, uh, delivery mechanisms that capture consciousness, that hijack workers who would have otherwise been on their way to the development of class consciousness, the development of solidarity, the development of a revolutionary platform, the development of progressive uh, political actions, potent action, right? They get hijacked instead, and they get placed in a society of spectacle. Now, now, as the board goes on, you know, we can write about, we can write or talk about this all you want. That the that children today 
are jammed in front of the spectacle very early, right? So my kids watch Teletubbies at like, you know, six months or something like that. There's been an explosion of media that's produced specifically for children, um, really, really tiny children. And so that little, little tiny children begin to relate to each other almost immediately based upon what the books that they read, uh, you know, Good Night Moon, I guess, is all the talk of the, of the, uh, of the crib. But, um, but, but, you know, where, where they begin to relate to each other very, very early on based upon shared consumption of media, okay? So, um, so yeah. So this is really what much of the talk on the playgrounds is, uh, what friendship networks are really based upon, shared consumption of media. It's what people do on dates, for heaven's sakes. They don't get together and talk about the forthcoming revolution. They get together and talk about, um, you know, good omens on, 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 uh, on Amazon or something. Okay. So that's the skeleton key to the book. The Society of the Spectacle is this thing that capital itself has generated to capture consciousness, to hijack consciousness, and to prevent workers or to forestall workers who were otherwise on their way to developing class consciousness to instead develop this silly thing called what I guess spectatorship consciousness or something like that consciousness of of spectacle taste for spectacle consumption spectacle and so on okay so that is when you defetishize a spectacle a film a television program uh, a political movement these days when you defetishize it this is what you get a bunch of work a bunch of spectators uh sitting together having their energy absorbed and sucked out of them while something else comes in again to the board it isn't the content doesn't matter this isn't really about the delivery of ideology okay so let's set that apart so another essence of the skeleton key is to put aside misreadings so Many who read the Society of the Spectacle or think about the Society of the Spectacle think that what DeBoard is critiquing is the delivery of content that is ideological. So something like right-wing authoritarian content, right? Or anti-worker content or pro-capital content, right? Uh, you, know, let, you know, broadcasting something like, you know, positive views of, say, billionaires or, uh, or negative views of labor movements or so on. But that's not really what's in, what's at stake here. It's not that um, the content, right? It's not the content that matters. That's not what's shaping consciousness. To deboard the main thing, we, like like you could have a spectacle that's pro worker. You could have a spectacle that's 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 showing how bad capital is, and as long as workers are sitting as spectators, passive, deanimated, impotent, right? The society of the spectacle is being generated and it's having the, the, the effect on capital that you want, right? And the effect is, is to prevent people from going to labor union meetings or communist party meetings or talking to other workers about their work process or how they can improve things or how we can actually build a progressive future. So in other words, it's not the content. You could have films that are pro-communist, films that are pro-worker, films that are anti-capital or have television programs or media sites that are it, do, it doesn't matter the content doesn't matter what matters is is the structure okay now that's a little bit overdrawn but it's but, but i think it works a parallel in durkheim's a suicide there's a moment where um um durkheim talks about um uh egoistic suicide one way that you could sort of overcome egoistic suicide is by joining a group <laughs> and that the content of the group doesn't matter the content of the teachings of the group doesn't matter just joining a group gives you social ties makes you altruistic in some way and so uh, you could actually join a society for the promotion of suicide and it would probably reduce suicide you'd be less likely to commit suicide by joining a group to promote suicide because it would bond you to other human beings and thereby give you a reason for living and keep you in the world, okay? It would negate egoism. So it's not the content of the group, it's the structure of the group that provides you with this altruistic tie, okay? The same thing here. It's not the content of the spectacle, but the structure of the society of spectacle 
that prevents the formation of the society of workers, the revolutionary movement, the class consciousness, the class solidarity, the the labor movement, right? Whatever it would be that would challenge capital's power and challenge its ability uh, to, to accumulate, okay? That's the skeleton key. It's not the content, it's the structure. And the structure is that of spectatorship, passivity, and deanimation. Okay. Clear enough? All right. Okay, so... Um, all right, so the political implications of this then are obvious and are foregrounded all throughout the book. Uh, the spectacle is a visit. The society of the spectacle is a visible negation of life, right? Of a life that has invented a visual form of itself. Okay, so whatever you're doing, no matter what you're watching, even if you're watching a program about nature or love or something like that, it nevertheless is a, a negation, a visible, right, visual negation of life. Where, again, life is not being lived because you're passively deanimated and not living um, while, while absorbing uh, a uh, uh, the spectacle. Okay. All right. So, therefore, we wind up with then uh, the new subject, the new uh, 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 consciousness, typical of late capital then is homo spectator. The subject, the being subject to passive receptivity of images who relates to others primarily through those images, right? So this is the subject of late capitalism, homo spectator, as opposed to like homo faber, the man, the maker, or um, it's the, the, the being who is subject to the receptivity, the passive receptivity of images, and then a bit the, relating to others only through those images. And again, if, if, you, if you don't see how, how powerful this is, uh, be someone like me who doesn't watch baseball or who doesn't really attend to hardly any spectator sports and then try to have conversations with people to relate to, uh, uh, to others. You almost feel like an alien because you can't speak the language or reference um, the, the relevant a content that others are, are interested in, right? So if you're not jamming yourself into the society spectacle, you're not attending to the content that allows you to have uh, relations to other spectators. By the way, you're never going to meet them if you're not at the spectacle either. Okay. So again, so the society of spectacle is easy to see in television fandoms, right? Uh, uh, or or movie going uh, uh, enthusiasts or sports fans, especially spectator sports. The passive social role of the spectator um, is the dominant social role, right? So the spectator becomes the dominant social role, the couch potato, the barca lounger jockey, uh, the sedentary viewer, right? That kind of thing. Scopophilic pleasures, the, the pleasures of the eye, the pleasures of viewing um, become the dominant pleasures, right? Um, yeah, and so that in the everyday life, even when it's face-to-face, -face, bears the content of spectatorship in the structure of, of the society of spectatorship, right? That's basically what you talk about. That's what dominates talk. Not work, not politically potent activity, not relating to each other in authentic uh, everyday life, but, uh, but the content of spectacle itself. Okay. All right, so it's easy to see in sort of like, you know, like situation comedies or, or, or a, a television series. It's harder to see when you're looking at uh, politics. So the society spectrum is also true of contemporary politics. To participate in politics today is primarily to watch televised debates, view tel uh, uh, political uh, news programs, opinion programs, watch political advertising, even attend political rallies. Um, these are all primarily spectatorship. Even at a rally, you're passive, dominated by appearance. You're primarily scopophilic. You're there to see the star. You know, uh, the, the political figure walking onto the stage and getting the whoops and the hollers and so on, right? You're stupefied. You're deanimated along with everyone else. Uh, you're been animized. Um, so something like a political rally is actually not a real event. A real event would be something like a demonstration that gets out of hand, a protest that would actually get out of hand, that would threaten something, a revolutionary act of some kind. That would be a real event. A political uh, a rally, a political debate, uh, a political um, um, appearance somewhere isn't an event. Even when there are large numbers of people there, those people are there primarily as spectators. You could 
take Donald Trump away at one of his rallies and substitute almost anything, um, yeah, a music singer, uh, a, a, an actor or actress, um, um, and you'd have a similar uh, a kind of unfolding of events, you know, people clapping, people cheering, and so on. Okay, so real events, politically potent events, are precluded, okay? So you have a politics of spectacle, a politics of distraction, right? Of distraction, where again, instead of going to the political rally, you wind up at the, um, and and you know, at at, at, at something like a, a spectatorship event instead. Okay, all right. Um, and by the way, just to note, Reagan himself was an actor. Trump was a re reality TV persona, and so th the idea of being the center of attention and of being. Um, someone capable of holding and managing spectators uh, was essential to to both of these people. I'm going to skip the reading here. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, these are important passages because, okay, so, so take a look at paragraph 21 and 24, 25. These are passages where the board compares and contrasts something like the old Durkheimian God or religious spectacle which unites people, unites a community of believers, unites a community of, uh, of people who live together, right? Under the notion of a God. Right back to this. Right? This is, this is uniting. The God unites a community that's actually bonded together with, with, with a variety of social ties. But the, but the, the um, Society of the Spectacle doesn't do that. The spectacle, unlike the God, isn't a collective representation of a working group of human beings. It's a collective representation of something that's fake, something that's not real. And so the people aren't people who are common spectators aren't bonded together as workers or as uh, people having a shared lived experience. They're simply bonded together uh, as, as, again, this politically impotent set of spectators. So the society of the spectacle doesn't unite a society of producers or society of workers with a unifying mirror. Right, which is what God was. It was the mirror of society. Instead, it keeps workers separated and alienated from each other as they are divided up and split off into a variety of different fandoms, spectatordoms, and so on. Some are fans of particular kinds of music. Some are fans of particular kind of religious leaders. Some are fans of particular kinds of, of politics or of, of, uh, of, of sporting events, of, of film genres, and so on. And so you get this, this, this splitting and fracturing, fragmentation, separation perfected, as the board says, okay? So pay, uh, paragraph 27, capital produces this alienation and separation as its primary product, okay? So late capitalism, the separation and alienation of workers outside of work is critical. Here we are. Perpetually forestalling political um, organizing work um, and you know, labor movements, work movements, and so on. The inactivity in real political life is replaced by inactivity in spectacle. So again, double alienation, paragraph 27. You're alienated at work during time on, and you're alienated in time off in your consumption of spectacle. Okay? So the separated worker never unites with other workers. They are re they don't unite with other workers. They are reunited as spectacles and as spectators in the society of spectacle. Paragraph 30 to 34, then, is that discussion of capital as a machine for absorbing human energy. There's this thing about how, how, how uh, this discussion of how the society spectacle is essentially a, uh, something that's intentionally generated as part of capital. Okay, um, so let's go here. Chapter 2, um, paragraphs uh, 35 to 36, a discussion of commodity fetishism. So I'm going to try to do this really fast. In, um, in these passages, De Board specifies that whatever the spectacle is, it's not going to depict workers or workers together as, as such. It tends to instead uh, mirror back capitalist society in the form of commodities, okay? So it tends to uh, engage in commodity fetishism is projected onto screen where commodities are presented and people relate to each other vis-a-vis uh, -vis commodities or people become, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, something like commodified personalities even, um, but they're not workers, okay? And even when you are workers being presented like, you know, like a work drama, you're not being presented primarily as people at work who are 
orienting to each other with something like class consciousness. Instead, it tends to be uh, orienting to each other as consumers or as spectators themselves and so on. Okay? All right. So the commodity tends to be dominant in the spectacle. Capital itself gets fetishized. Um, billionaires, CEOs, Wall Street uh, uh, people, bankers, really wealthy people tend to be represented in the spectacle much more so than the poor. The poor are represented in a negative way, almost as demons. Uh, people are being arrested or, or um, uh, and so on. Whereas uh, capital and capitalists and the wealthy are presented positively. Again, labor fetishes, the fetishism of, of workers as such is very rare and uh, tends to be de-emphasized. Um, paragraph 40. Um, so as capital proceeds through the 20th century into the 21st century, we never get to affluence is his point. The, the claim that we're moving into an affluent society is wrong. He calls it instead augmented survival, the colonization of everyday life by commodities and images and spectacle itself. The reason he says this is because there is, you know, in paragraph 47, a falling rate of use value that... Um, as we become rich in needs through the development of consumer capitalism and we have to buy an ever larger uh, basket of goods, a quantitatively expanded basket of goods to meet our basic needs, each additional item that we add in adds a smaller and smaller utility or usefulness to us so that the next thing we buy provides us less satisfaction than the previous thing that we bought. This is a basic argument. So what we have then is an augmented survival which never becomes abundance uh, because there is a marginal utility uh, that declines as consumption expands. So uh, paragraph 51, pseudo needs rather than actual desires and riches. He writes about, you know, so these bizarre things like we have a desire for you know, I don't think it always gets me. It's like people go get massages by having like hot rocks placed on their back or something. Nobody needs that, right? But there it is, right? Um, nobody needs to collect items or, or uh, you know, nobody needs chia pets, right? Uh, these are pseudo needs. So at any rate, um, nobody needs the NASCAR race, but you can write a book about it anyway. Um, okay, so paragraph 53, clear statement, the society of the spectacle precludes class consciousness and revolutionary action. These two things are, are, are again, are divergent. So if you have a society of the spectacle, it decreases your likelihood of having a society of workers with class consciousness and revolutionary action. Chapter 3 <coughs> is where he differentiates in paragraph 63 between the concentrated spectacle um, affiliated with sort of authoritarian regimes um, Maoism or Stalinism or the worship of Putin. I think Trumpism, to a large degree, is an effort to sort of reconcentrate uh, the spectacle back on the face of an authoritarian leader, while nevertheless promoting capital accumulation along the way. Um, free market capitalism, or what passes for it, um, is, is the diffuse spectacle. So instead of having a kind of a unified figurehead or a dominant sort of propaganda machine at the center of government that's unified in all of its messaging, <coughs> you have a variety of, of, of products, of services, of brands, of, of formats, of genres that aren't unified in any way. They compete against each other in some ways, but nevertheless present something like uh, a legitimation of capital simply because it keeps workers from developing um, yeah, class consciousness. Okay. Um, paragraph 67, he writes about absurd commodities and absurd pseudo needs. Again, like even things like, you know, producing products not to be used but only to be collected, that kind of stuff. It's absurd, yet yeah, we do it. Um, again, uh, the spectacle likes to present the image of blissful unification of society through consumption. That's the essence of what this, the content of the spectacle is. The image of a Blissful unification of society through consumption. That's the essence of the spectacle. It sort of like meets, hits its peak when it can do that. Um, yeah, so the spectacle then is an unreal unity, masking exploitation, savage class um, uh, division, and so on. Chapter 4, uh, let me see. Yeah, again, he talks again about the concentrated and the and, uh, spectacle I'm going to kind of skip all of this. We're running out of time. Um, 
uh, chapter 5, he writes about pseudo-cyclical time. Chapter 6, spectacular time, um, in which time itself gets reconstructed. There's a kind of denial of death that we know goes along with late capital. And um, so we step out of time. The worker movement, the communist movement was all embedded within time. Seeing capital as something that's ever changing and that's not naturalized or inevitable or universal leads to workers interjecting themselves in the system and starting to, to rework um, the system, recognizing that workers' rights were less in the past, could be greater in the future, um, and so on. That these are all important parts of recognizing history and historical time. Uh, Debord argues that the spectacle tends to disconnect people from time and create something called pseudo-cyclical time, right? So uh, prepackaged time, administered experience, and so on. Um, and the important part of that, paragraph 156 and 157, um, this means that events are over. As long as you're in the spectacle, nothing really happens, right? As long as you're in the spectacle, the spectacle changes, but the spectators don't. You stay in your seat, you know, and watch newsreels changing or watch the news change, but you're always in your seat in your same Barca lounger as the stain behind your, the grease stain of your head gets deeper and darker over time. But you never change, only the spectacle does. I'm thinking of, of uh, the, the Barca lounger of old men. Anyway, um, so the spectacle changes, but the spectator doesn't. And the society of the spectacle doesn't. It stays the same even though the spectacle changes. And then, so events don't happen. Political, politics is impotent, okay? And then, and then the last point 157 I'm going to make is this means that private traumatic events, events still happen to individuals, right? We're born, we get ill, we die, we have traumas in our relationships, we have traumas in our families. Um, we have traumas in our careers and so on. We still experience traumatic events. We're in the middle of one right now. The coronavirus, a pandemic, will be remembered by each of us. And the way that the, that the pandemic has hit us is going to be individualized, right? It's going to be traumatic to each of us in a different way. But that'll be disconnected from the way that the coronavirus pandemic exists in the spectacle. It's going to be forgotten very quickly in the spectacle. And it'll only, be, it'll only exist as a kind of model for future um, uh, 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 pandemics going forward. So, so, so I love this line, paragraph one fifty seven. Our private traumatic events and even our celebratory events, the big turning points in our individual biography, are not etched in time and etched in memory. They're lost. And the more that we're part of a society, the spectacle, the more that our own private traumas are forgotten. So, in the society of spectacle, we can talk to other spectators about what happened to the Patriots uh, in, in the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, whatever, right? But we can't talk to each other about the traumas, again, that are etched deeply in our own biography, but that aren't shared. And so we can talk again about, we talk more readily and more easily about a singer losing her voice or a an actor whose career ends or the uh, the injuries of a sports figure. We can talk with each other about that more than we can talk about those same uh, experiences happening to us. So the traumatic events of our life, the celebratory events of our life, are etched on our private conscience only slightly, and they wind up overwritten by the spectacle. Okay. So what happens to the Kardashians is apparently of more moment than what happens to my grandma. Okay. All right, so that's the skeleton key then to the book. You can read the rest of it yourself. I hope this was useful, and uh, I'll see you in, with the next one.